You are listening to continuing coverage of the trial of Chad Daybell from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. Let's go back to the courtroom. Agent Hart, can you indicate the date these images were sent? These were both sent on August 7th of 2019. Were you able to, looking at that first image there, who is that? That is Chad Daybell. Can you tell from the photo what type of building he may be in? Yes, it's uh, the lobby of an LDS, an old LDS church. And who sent that photo? So the photo of Chad Daybell was sent by Alex Cox to Lori Vallow with the caption, look at the bubbies. Do you know what bubbies was a reference to? That was a word. Judge objections, calling for speculation, no foundation. I'll sustain that without additional foundation. Through your investigation and review of messages, were you able to determine what Bubbies was in reference to? Yes. And what was that? It's just simply a pet name that Lori had for Chad Daybell and Alex Cox or other men in her life. And could you see the time that that message was sent? 1048 a.m. And turning to the next image, who are we seeing in that photo? That's a photograph of Alex Cox. Does that appear to be in the same location? Yes. And when? what time was that message sent? One minute prior on 1047 a.m. Who sent that message? Chad Daybell. And who did he send it to? Lori Vallow. What was the caption that Chad included? Two exalted beings. Was Tammy Daybell still alive on August 7th of 2019? Yes. Moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. Would you please indicate the date these messages were sent into the record? These messages were exchanged on August 7th of 2019. Who were the messages exchanged between? Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. And these messages were sent on the same day as those two images? Correct. What about these messages stood out to you? The thing that stood out the most in this text series is in line 1391 in the text from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell, where she indicates, we are both so tired of taking care of demons. We are weary. Please ask the Lord to take them, exclamation point. And Lori was sending that request to Chad? Correct. And moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. Anija Hart, can you indicate the date these messages were sent into the record? These messages were exchanged on August 10th of 2019. And is it fair to say that some of the next slides are going to correspond with the same date? Yes, it's this slide and the next five slides are all a um, continuous exchange of messages between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. What about this first slide with these messages caught your attention in relation to the investigation? What first caught my attention is we see now, I believe, the fourth time that Lori Vallow is asking uh, Chad Daybell to check on uh, JJ. And Chad Daybell responds once again that JJ is still JJ. And at this point, Charles has been dead for almost a month? Correct. Through the investigation and your review of the information in this case, did Lori have help with JJ prior to Charles passing? Absolutely. And who was helping her with him? Charles Vallow uh, spent a considerable amount of time and effort in in caring for Judge, I'm going to object at this point. Move to strike. There hasn't been sufficient foundation. Sustained. Through the review of iCloud, did you review videos? Yes. Did you review other content? Yes. In that content, were there references to Charles taking care of JJ? Many. And at the time... These percentages are being pursued. Charles is no longer able to assist with JJ. Correct. Moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, you'd indicated this is a continuation of the previous slide? Yes. And what about these particular messages caught your attention? Well, primarily line 1170 in the last line of the previous slide, Lori Vallow asks Chad Daybell if JJ is at zero yet. And we see Chad Daybell's response to that question. Yes, he's at zero. He was probably partly through the veil talking to people, both light and dark. And on the previous slide in this one, we again see a reference to Blake. Again, who was Blake? 
Blake is uh, Melanie Boudreaux's child. Moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, is this again a continuation of the previous two slides? It is. Who are these messages being exchanged between? Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. What about these particular messages stood out to you in relation to the investigation? This particular conversation is some of the most critical evidence that I located within the iCloud. It represents the clearest and most specific reference. Judge, I'm going to object again. This is speculation. Overruled. It represents the clearest and most specific reference to a plan regarding Tylee and JJ. That plan is spearheaded by Chad Daybell. Judge, I'm going to object at this point. That's a narrative. And it's argumentative. It's sustained. And I'm going to move to strike. Uh, that last part of the comment is stricken. When you indicate that there's the reference to the plan, who is asking if there's a plan? Lori Vallow is asking Chad Daybell if there is a, quote, perfectly orchestrated plan to take the children. What is Chad's response? Chad's response is that there is a plan being orchestrated for the children. Where were Tylee and JJ's remains ultimately located? On Chad Daybell's property. And moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, is this also a continuation from some of the previous slides? Yes, it is. Who are these messages being sent between? Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. What about these particular messages stood out to you in relation to your, the investigation? Well, first off is line 1159. In the previous slide, there was a question about a plan and a verification of a plan. Then Lori Vallow asks Chad Daybell, what should I be doing? And in the subsequent line, 1158, Chad Daybell provides an answer to her, which concludes with being unencumbered and fully free. There's also a reference in that to telestial issues. Do you know through the investigation what telestial would be referencing? I do. What is that? Uh, issues pertaining to this earthly life. And in some of the previous messages, Lori was inquiring about the death percentages of Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow. That's correct. What else stood out in relation to these messages? Line 1155 is very critical. Chad Daybell texts Lori Vallow, uh, and indicates that J.J. is, quote, getting close. When I was sitting across from him eating bacon, I sensed he was barely attached to his body. Do you know when the last time J.J. Vallow was seen? I do. When was that? September 22nd, 2019. And moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, again, is this a continuation of some of those previous slides? Yes, it is. And I believe there's one more uh, that is part of this conversation. I'm going to move to that slide and pause to allow the jurors to read that one as well. And going back to that previous slide, what about this one caught your attention? Well, it, it's this is just the continuation of the conversation. I think the more important content is on the following slide. And what about these particular messages stood out to you? Primarily lines 1117 and 1113. In 1117, Lori Vallow, as we've seen previously, uh, says to Chad Daybell, I can't wait, literally can't wait. I have no patience. I want you now with two fire emojis. And then we see Chad Daybell's response to that, which point. Based on your investigation, your review of the content of the iCloud, what did you determine the finish line to be? The finish line was for Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow to live this fantasy life together that they had constructed and referenced in this plan that they're talking about. Did that include being unencumbered? Judge, I'm an object. Calls for speculation. Overruled. Unencumbered from her husband and her children and from his wife. Yes. Your Honor, looking at the time, I don't know if you'd like to do the mid-morning break. I think this would be a good time for that. Thank you, Ms. Blake. We will take our mid-morning recess. We'll come back on 
Uh, just 10.30 or perhaps shortly before 10.30. Thank you. All rise, please. All rise. Just the course again in second. Thank you. Please be seated. All right, Mr. Bailiff, we'd like the jurors brought in, please. Thank you. All right, please. Here's our president counter for you. Thank you. Please be seated. All right. Uh, we're back on the record on CR 22211623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Daybell. Continuing with direct examination, Agent Hart, if you'd like to continue, Ms. Blake, you may. Thank you, Your Honor. And may I go back to publishing? Yes, you may. And Agent Hart, we'd left off with this slide. Do you recall that? Yes. And we'd left off talking about the finish line? Correct. Was this the last slide that was part of this particular series of texts? Yes, it was. And moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, can you indicate the date that these messages were being exchanged? Yes, this text exchange is from September 3rd of 2019. Who are the messages being exchanged between? Between Alex Cox and his sister, Lori Vallow. Do you know where Lori Vallow was living at this time? Yes, both Alex Cox and Lori Vallow moved to Rexburg, Idaho from Arizona on September 1st of 2019. Was there anything else about these messages that stood out to you? Uh, line 26, uh, excuse me, 264 from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow, where he indicates the, the network password is too many kids. And her response is funny, exclamation point, exclamation point. When was the last known sighting of Tylee Ryan? Last known sighting of Tylee Ryan was September 8th of 2019. And when was the last known sighting of J.J. Vallow? September 22nd of 2019. And moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. <laughs> and Agent Hart, is this a continuation from the previous slide? Yes, it is. Who are these messages between? Again, between Alex Cox and Lori Vallow. What about these particular messages caught your attention in relation to the investigation? In relation to the investigation, these few messages provide a little bit of insight as to uh, Alex Cox's role within this uh, small circle of people, uh, Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. And in that line, do you know what the Z's was referring to based on your investigation? I do. What would Z's be in reference to? Z's is uh, an abbreviation for zombies. And then when we look to that line 261 in particular, was there something about that that stood out to you? Yes. Lori Vallow indicates uh, that they're trying to get to the bottom of what we need to do to eliminate them completely. And then she indicates to Alex Cox that he would be told also and so to me, that sheds light on on Judge, I'm gonna object. It's becoming a narrative and it's calling for speculation. Overruled. It sheds light on Alex's knowledge, how much knowledge he has, and that he too would be told what to do or what his role would be. In your review of these messages, was Alex included in the text regarding death percentages? He was not. And this message indicates Alex would be told. Correct. And what was Alex's response? Excellent. And again, those messages were exchanged on September 3rd of 2019? Yes. What are we seeing in this slide? This slide uh, contains a very short, it's just a few seconds, um, video that I located within the iCloud. As part of our investigation, we went to great pains to try to determine uh, when Tylee was killed and when was the last known sighting uh, that we could verify. And that last known sighting is on September 8th, 2019. Uh, this is a video uh, of a trip that was taken with Lori Vallow, Alex Cox, 
JJ and Tylee to Yellowstone National Park. It's the last known uh, living proof for Tylee. And this is five days after the messages about eliminating zombies completely? Yes. And five days after the messages about Alex being told what to do? Yes. And who else was in that video? Tylee is hugging her younger brother, JJ, and Alex Cox is standing off to the side. Can you tell us what we're seeing in this? Slide. Yes, in a similar vein, um, we searched for what would be the last known sighting or living proof of JJ. And uh, this is uh, what I located on the iCloud. Uh, it's uh, from September 22nd of 2019 at 1046 a.m. in the morning. Subsequent to this video, there are no other photos or videos existing in the iCloud of JJ. And again, where were JJ and Tylee's remains found? Chad Daybell's property. Moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, can you indicate the date these messages were exchanged? These are from September 24th of 2019. Who are these messages between? These are messages between Sidney Woodbury and Lori Vallow. And in relation to this date, was it significant? Yes. And why was that? The date is two days after our last known living proof for JJ. What else about these messages stood out to you in relation to your investigation? These are the first lies we can find documented by Lori Vallow uh, regarding JJ and his Whereabouts. And moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, there's three messages here that all contain a different date. Is that correct? It is. At the time these messages were exchanged, was Charles Vallow alive? No. Was Tylee Ryan believed to be alive? No. JJ Vallow believed to be alive? Nope. Was Tammy Daybell alive? Yes. Looking at the first message, can you indicate the date that was sent? First message was sent on October 3rd of 2019. Who was it being sent from and who was it going to? This was a message from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. Was there something about that message that stood out to you? Yes. Chad Daybell indicated that he was so excited to go on a date with Lori Vallow. And the next one, can you indicate the date? It's the following day, October 4th, 2019. And who is that message from? That's a message from Lori Vallow to her brother, Alex Cox. And what about that, if anything, caught your attention? Well, at this point, uh, they had both Alex Cox and Lori Vallow had moved to Rexburg, Idaho, were living in Rexburg, Idaho. And the, indicate, the investigation indicates that uh, Tammy or Tylee and JJ were both deceased at this point. Lori Vallow says to Alex Cox, we are supposed to go on a, quote, real date tonight, but are discussing it. And then she indicates perhaps an evening at home would be better. So we are not out and about. And again, at this time, Tammy Daybell is still alive. She is. Where was Lori Vallow living at this time? She was living in Rexburg, Idaho, which is a very short distance from Sugar City, where the Daybell residence was located. And then looking at that last message, can you indicate the date? October 5th, 2019. Who was that message being sent from and who was it going to? So this is a message from Chad Daybell uh, to Lori Vallow. And then there will be two more slides that are a continuation of Chad Daybell reaching out to Lori Vallow approximately 12 hours after the prior text uh, indicating that an evening home may be better rather than a, a real date. And in that last message, can you read, actually, can you read that last message into the record? Hello, sweet angel. Big news about Tammy. Please let me know if you are awake and can talk. I love you, exclamation point, and then heart and lip emojis. There's an indication in there from Chad to Lori that there's big news about Tammy. Is that correct? That's correct. 
And moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, can you indicate the date these messages were exchanged? Yes, the date is October 5th, 2019. And the times are, are within minutes of one another, as well as within minutes of the prior uh, text where Chad Daybell indicated he had big news about Tammy. And looking at these messages, were there things that caught your attention? Yes, there's two text messages on this slide and then two more text messages. All four of these text messages are from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. I found no response from Lori Vallow to these messages. Uh, but in these messages, uh, Chad Daybell is providing an explanation, a narrative indicating that Tammy has been switched and that there is a demonic entity that is now in Tammy Daybell's body that she wants removed. And that word removed, I think, uh, is critical. And do you see in here a reference to the, de the name of the demonic entity? Yes. Uh, the, the name that Chad Daybell assigns to this demonic entity is Viola. Judge, I'm going to object, move to strike. There's no testimony regarding who assigned what. Overruled. We talked about the word removal based on your review of the iCloud account, your review of other things involved in this investigation. What was significant about removal? Removal indicates the physical death of the person who has the demonic entity. And moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, I believe you indicated this is a continuation from the previous slide. It is. These are all, I believe the very first text message was 4.36 a.m. And so the final text, the final and fifth text message in this stream, all from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow, is at 4.54 a.m. And again, what day? On October 5th of 2019. What about these particular messages caught your attention in relation to the investigation? In relation to the investigation, line uh, 769 is a crucial piece of evidence from the iCloud that is a very specific reference to the alleged crimes involving Tammy Daybell. Judge object, mischaracterization, speculation, argumentative. I'm going to sustain that as argumentative. We had just talked about the meaning of the word removal in the investigation. Do you see reference to removal in this line? I do. Chad Daybell writes, not fully sure of the timing for removal, but once her actions verify the differences, I don't want to wait. What happened on October 9th of 2019? October 9th. Answer, Judge. What was that? Objection. I asked and answered. Overruled. On October 9th, 2019, was the first attempt on Tammy Daybell's life. Moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, can you indicate the date these messages were being exchanged? These are messages exchanged on October 19th, 2019. What was significant about October 19th of 2019 in your investigation? That is the date of Tammy Daybell's death. Who were these text messages being exchanged between? This is between Lori Vallow and an individual who uh, wasn't identified by name uh, within the iCloud. So I, I can't tell you who this is that's telling her this information. What was significant about these messages or... Let me withdraw that. What caught your attention in relation to these messages? Simply that someone knew that Tammy Daybell had died and then provided that information to Lori Vallow, who was in Hawaii at the time. Do you know where Chad Daybell was at the time? In his residence in Sugar City, Idaho. Do you know where Alex Cox was? Alex Cox was in Rexburg, Idaho. And moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, can you indicate the date these messages were exchanged? Again, on October 19th, 2019. And who were these messages being exchanged between? These are between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. What in relation to these messages stood out to you in relation to the investigation? Primarily the timing of the messages uh, in conjunction with Tammy Daybell's death and then this is the first in a 
series of uh, messages over the next 24 hours or so between uh, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow subsequent to uh, Tammy Daybell's death. And again, Tammy Daybell was pronounced dead on October 19th of 2019. Yes, the uh, call, the 911 call uh, was approximately 6 a.m. on October 19th, 2019. So the same day these messages are exchanged. Correct. And move to the next slide and pause to allow the jurors to read. <clears throat> Agent Hart, can you indicate the date these messages were exchanged? These messages are on October 20th, 2019. And who are these messages between? Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. And this is the day after Tammy's been pronounced dead? Well, the first two messages, as you can see, are are just past midnight, so they're approximately 18 hours after Tammy Daybell's death. And then the last two messages are approximately 25 and a half hours uh, after that 911 call regarding Tammy Daybell's death. What else about these messages stood out to you in relation to the investigation? Well, line 527 uh, on that date is a text from Chad to Lori Vallow um, where he indicates, I love talking with you. It's baby night, uh, so come get me later. Do you know where Lori Vallow would have been at that time? She's in Hawaii. In the messages that you reviewed shortly after Tammy's death, any expression of grief by Chad Daybell regarding his wife's death? None. Any expression of grief by Lori Vallow? None. And if you recall when you testified previously, you'd reviewed messages around the time of Charles' death. Is that correct? Yes. Any expression of grief by Lori in those? None. Any expression of grief by Chad in those? No. Moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, can you indicate the date these messages were exchanged? October 20th of 2019 in the early morning hours. And who are they being exchanged between? Again, it's a continuation between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. Were there things about these particular messages that stood out to you in relation to the investigation? We're now getting into the logistics of Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow uh, being together subsequent to Tammy Daybell's death. Lori Vallow actually invites Chad to jump on a plane and come to Kauai. Uh, and Chad Daybell responds that she should come back to the mainland so that they can spend the night together on Thursday and then indicates wanting to look for a condo um, so that they could return to Kauai at the first of the month, meaning November. And do you recall from your previous testimony reviewing some messages regarding a plan to be in Kauai? I do. And who was that plan between? Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. Do you know if Chad and Lori were ultimately married? They were. Where did they get married? On the island of Kauai. Do you know where Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow moved to? The island of Kauai. And this conversation took place about 25 hours after Tammy Daybell had been pronounced dead? About 26 hours after the 911 call by Chad Daybell uh, to indicate to authorities that his wife was dead. Moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. <laughs> and Agent Hart, would you indicate the date that these messages were exchanged? October 20th of 2019. And are these a continuation from some of the previous slides we've reviewed? Yes, they are. And who were these messages between? Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. In relation to your investigation, what stood out to you with these messages? Again, it's a continuation of uh, the fulfillment of their plans to be together. The first line, 5118, Chad Daybell indicates uh, a workout plan for Lily, who is Lori Vallow, uh, that he wants to tighten his abs, get a full body tan, grow his hair out, and that it could be really good for both him and Lori Vallow. And in that last one, 516, do you know who Raphael and Lily is referring to? Those are, again, alternate names for Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. And is there an indication there about how much they will be together? A hundred percent. Moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. <laughs> Agent Hart, can you please indicate the date these messages were exchanged? Yes, this is the conclusion of this text string, and the date is October 20th, 2019. And who are the messages between? 
Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. Was there anything that stood out to you in relation to the investigation in these messages? Yes. In line 515, you have Lori Vallow indicating how consuming her love is for Chad Daybell. And then of note, line 514, Chad Daybell responds, I know exactly how you feel. I'm feeling sad, but it isn't for the reason everyone thinks, exclamation point. Through the investigation, did you learn what the connection between Alex Cox and Chad Daybell was? Yes. What was that? Alex Cox was an adherent of Chad Daybell. Judge, objection, argumentative. Sustained. Did Chad beat Alex through Lori? Yes. Based on your investigation, review of messages, and other things, would Alex do as Chad asked? Judge, objection, argumentative. Overruled. Yes. Did Tammy Daybell know Alex Cox based on what you learned in the investigation? No, she did not. Was the only connection between Tammy and Alex Chad? Correct. Moving to the next slide. I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, can you indicate the date these messages were exchanged? Yes, October 23rd of 2019. And who were the messages being exchanged between? Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. And do you recall in a previous slide talking about a message where Alex was going to be told information also? Yes. What about these messages stood out to you in relation to the investigation? In relation to the investigation, primarily lines 482 and 481 stood out to me. In line 482, Lori Vallow indicates she's had a bad dream about Al. And primarily line 481, Lori indicates that Alex Cox would be the one they use to get us both. All this alone time is not good for him. So something that Alex Cox knows is a risk to Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. Based on your investigation, review of the iCloud, and other information, who was the they being referred to? Objection, speculation. Overruled. I believe that is a direct reference to law enforcement. What is Chad's response in line 479? Chad Daybell indicates, I will try to reach out to him later today. So Chad was going to be the one to reach out to Al. Correct. And Lori was requesting Chad's help with talking to Al. Correct. And again, through your review of the messages, who was seeking information? Primarily Lori Vallow. And who was providing the answers? Primarily Chad Daybell. I have no further questions. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. All right, Mr. Pryor, cross-examination. Thank you, Judge. Agent Hart, there was a, um, a discussion about uh, when you're investigating uh, missing children, who the um, potential um, um, folks that you would uh, look to if you were uh, starting your investigation. Do you recall that discussion? Yes. And wouldn't it be fair to say that an obvious person to look for or look at when you're investigating missing children would be a new husband. In addition to others, yes. Uh, we, we would look at the parent or the husband. I guess my point was you can't put blinders on. You can't exclusively hone in on one person at the onset of an investigation. Right. And it would be inappropriate to do that. I mean, when you're looking and in, in conducting an investigation, wouldn't it be fair to say that any and all evidence that you obtain, you should look at all leads of, of, of evidence and not target your investigation in one channel. Would that be fair? Yes, that's what we did. Okay. And that's what you're, as far as the FBI, that's what you did, right? I participated in dozens of meetings with the Rexburg Police Department and the Fremont County Sheriff's Office. It's my belief that's what all of us did. Okay. So again, just to reiterate, it's your contention that you didn't... Um, fail to investigate or look into uh, um, evidence that might lead you in a different direction. Would that be fair? That's correct. Okay. Now, as part of your FBI training, you talked about that you were involved in the uh, task of, of looking for identifying missing children, correct? 
Yes. And as part of that FBI training, is it your experience or the FBI's experience that they ever utilize the uh, use of uh, a medium to uh, a, to try to locate or talk to to children who have passed on? It's extremely common for people who claim to have those abilities to come forward, but no, the FBI does not employ mediums in in its investigations. And I didn't say employ, I said utilize, but do you know the name Allison Dubois? I believe I'm familiar with that name, yes. And, and Ms. Dubois is a medium who claims to have the ability to uh, talk to children and to... Objection, help. Your Honor. Counsel's testifying. Move to strike. Stain. What is your knowledge of Allison Dubois? It's my belief that she holds herself out to be a spiritual medium. And that spiritual medium is, is, is being able to talk to children who have passed on? I couldn't say specifically what abilities she claims to have. Okay, and has, I don't want to say employ, but has the FBI or any agency you've been involved in ever employed Alison Dubois or any other medium in helping gain information? Objection, Your Honor. Relevance? Overruled. Gain information about uh, the whereabouts or the circumstances surrounding the death of a uh, children or, or anyone in particular. Well, Mr. Pryor, when you say... When I said employ, I think I mean the same thing you do as utilize, okay. n- not not pay money to. Um, I am not, I've never spoken with Allison Dubois. I've never requested her services. To my knowledge, nobody in this investigation requested her services. Many times these people come forward offering their services and offering what they claim to have seen. So you are familiar that there are people out there um, who, as a professional occupation, claim to be able to uh, to engage in these spiritual uh, exercises, for lack of a better word, correct? Objection, Your Honor. Relevance. Sustained. Okay. So would it be fair to say that if Chad Daybell placed himself out as someone who uh, claims to be able to, to have these spiritual gifts, that in itself is not unusual. Would you agree with that? I don't believe it's common. Uh, okay. Uh, your concern is that the the number of text messages in reference to Tammy and the children, that's where you, you, you say that's where we potentially have a problem, correct? Given what happened to Tammy and Tylee and JJ, yes. Okay. Okay. Now, I noticed um, during your um, dissertation with all of your exhibits, uh, on around 8-11, uh, August 11th of 2019, it appears that there are some, some, some captions that were, were left out regarding a breakup between Lori and Chad Daybell. Do you recall that? I believe those were included in the first uh, testimony that I provided a number of weeks ago. Okay, and, the, and those were not included in today's testimony, is that right? They were not part of today's testimony. Do you have a specific recollection of what was involved in, in, in the, 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 uh, the, the language that was used that you could read and provide us in terms of uh, testimony regarding those, uh, those emails? I, I, yes, I can certainly give you my best recollection. It won't be verbatim. And, and if we, you want verbatim, we'd have to go back to the exhibit that was used uh, during my testimony previously. And Judge, previously, uh, the state and the defense stipulated to the admission of the uh, Lori for style um, uh, uh, contents of that particular account. I'm holding in my possession Exhibit 7U. I'm going to ask that the uh, court mark this as an exhibit and move for admission by, I don't know that the state has an objection to that. The state does not have an objection. I just wanted to clarify which ones. Very well. We'll get that marked for you, Mr. Pryor. And then, thank you, Judge. Can you clarify what's in seven U? Judge, it's a content of approximately four uh, text messages um, between Lori Vallow and Chad, Chad Daybell, dating from eight eleven of two thousand nineteen. All right, Exhibit seven U is being marked and will be admitted. Thank you, Judge. May I have the court's permission to publish? Yes, and it might take me a minute, Judge, or more than a minute. And Judge, if we could start publishing. All right, we will. Now, office, uh, officer, I apologize. Agent, um, 
Line 856 uh, talks about the, from Chad Dable to Lori Vallow, the next two days will be torture. Do you see that? I do. Then uh, there's a comment from Chad, makes a comment. And could you read that, thankfully? Uh, thankfully, I will be alone most of Wednesday and beyond. Okay. And then we go to line 854. Are these in, these are, there's no um, text messages that are in between each of these. Is that correct? So in the um, iCloud, th there can be. So in between 856 and 854, Lori Vallow could have gotten a text from a friend about lunch. And so they're just arranged and given a line number based on the date and time. So that's how this works. Okay. So the time on the first one, 856 is at 956. The the 854 would be the next correspondence from Lori Vallow to Chad, correct? Yes. And if you could read that entire uh, text message, starting with the word is. Is that what he wants for me to sit around waiting for you endlessly and you miserably wasting time? It just doesn't feel right. Exclamation point. Okay. Now you talked about um, the manipulation that was engaged in, in, in these uh, many of these. And you said, use the word many from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. Is this an example in your mind of Lori Vallow again, manipulating Chad Daybell? Absolutely. It was a two-way street. Lori Vallow would manipulate Chad Daybell and vice versa. Okay. And Chad's manipulation would be talking about the religious knowledge that he claims to have in this vast wisdom. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So on two levels, we have manipulation, at least according to you. Uh, we would have manipulation because someone's claiming to have some religious knowledge and, and espouses that by trying to impress Lori Vallow with that vast religious knowledge, correct? I think it's more than knowledge. I think it's direction. Okay. And then in Lori's case, this is manipulation and, and trying to get Chad to do what she wants him to do, correct? Yes, I would agree. Okay. Okay. And Judge, could we unpublish at this point to like move to the next slide? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. And then if we could publish again. Go ahead. And then again on 811, it talks about uh, Chad to Lori Vallow. I'm frustrated. I'm sorry, honey. And then let's go to line 843, which appears to have occurred at about the same time the first text. And if you could, um, if you could read line 843, starting with you. You can't just keep tearing my heart out. I really can't take it anymore. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. And then let's go down to line 841 and start with reading that one for me. What about the past two days? I didn't even get to talk to you on your birthday. I'm clearly not a priority. I just don't want to be so sad all the time and do heart broken. And again, in your professional experience with dealing with this case, is that another instance where Lori Vallow may be trying to manipulate Chad Daybell? Certainly. Okay, thank you. And Judge, if we could unpublish again. Yes. And let's uh, publish again, Judge. Okay. And then if you would read line 840. If you really loved me, you wouldn't want that either. Okay. And then uh, Chad Daybell responds. That was from Lori Vallow to Chad, correct? Yes. And then two minutes later, Chad uh, discusses that he couldn't have talked. The girls were there. And then he, and he expresses his true love for Lori Vallow, correct? Yes. And then if you would do, be so kind, uh, two, two minutes later at 1015, Lori Vallow texts Chad Daybell. Uh, and if you could just read the entire... Uh, um, line starting with you you should give all of you love and your attention to your wife and family i'm just a distraction go have fun with your family i really do want you to i just can't be in the way anymore if things change then we can talk but we have nothing until things change anyway and once again i don't want to keep uh, reiterating this but this is another example of Lori Vallow uh, attempting to manipulate Chad Daybell. Would you agree? I would. Okay. And it seems a little bit final. And it seems as if that the suggestion here is on 8 11 of 2019 that there's a breakup between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. Do you agree with that? I do. Okay. Judge, we can unpublish this. All right. 
All right. That concludes cross. Any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Your Honor, I would request permission to publish from 183B the printout of the PowerPoint. I can use the drive if necessary. All right. We'll get you the exhibit on the drive. Agent Hart, you were asked about manipulation by Lori Vallow from counsel. Do you recall that? I do. Through your investigation, did you also find manipulation by Chad Daybell? I did. Did you find that manipulation around the same time of the breakup? I found it throughout the entire course of the investigation. And again, through the investigation and based on your review, who would determine someone was dark? Chad Daybell. Who would determine if someone was a zombie? Chad Daybell. Who would determine? Judge, I'm going to object at this point. It's going beyond the scope of cross-examination. Overruled. Who would determine death percentages? Chad Daybell. And Your Honor, I would request permission to just publish one page of the slide, but the printed out uh, for ease. Yes, you may publish the printed version on the Elmo if you'll identify what it is when you do that. Yes, it is slide 18 from the printed version of Exhibit 183B. Agent Hart, who is the one that indicates there is a plan being orchestrated? Chad Daybell. And do you see the reference in there to the children? I do. Do you know where Tammy Daybell's body was located when she was pronounced dead? Tammy Daybell's body was located in the bedroom in their home. Where were the bodies of Tylee and JJ located? Tylee and JJ were both located on the pasture property of the residence. And was that the residence of who again? Chad Daybell. I have no further questions. All right. Thank you. That will conclude the testimony then of Agent Hart. Does the state have any additional witnesses to call in its case in chief? We do not, Your Honor. All right. So has the state rested at this time? Judge, if we may have a brief sidebar. Yes. All right. We just had a sidebar to discuss some scheduling matters. Uh, at this time, I had inquired from the state if the state had another witness to call at this time or whether the state had concluded its case in chief. Ms. Blake? The state does not have any additional witnesses. The state rests. All right. The state is now rested. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, uh, in terms of our scheduling, that is going to conclude the evidence portion for today. Uh, we did not provide lunch today, believing we'd end here early. However, before you leave, uh, you'll be delayed a little bit while the uh, jury commissioner is going to just talk to you about a little additional information and scheduling at my direction. And so we will um, take up those matters with you shortly. And at this time, then we'll take a recess. And then if the parties wish to come back on the record for any motions outside the presence of the jury, we can do that as well. So we'll take our recess at this time and let the jurors be excused to the jury room. All right. All right. Thank you. Please be seated. Um, I'll note that the last witness, Agent Hart, is uh, still, I'm advised by the state, I believe, going to be held under subpoena potentially for rebuttal. Is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Okay. We just advise the witness he's done for today, but he's still subject to the exclusionary order. Um, at this time, also then, I do want to take a recess here uh, because I do want to meet briefly with the jury commissioner and we'll take a break. And then Mr. Prior is the defense intending to make any motion today. Judge, I anticipate making a motion, a, a general motion for a directed verdict, Judge. I'll describe it that way. Okay. Um, why don't we plan on that? I know it's maybe an inconvenient time, but in about 30 minutes, probably. So, Thank 10 you, after, Honor. we'll take the motion up then. Thank you, Judge. Okay. Thanks. We'll be in recess until then. All rise. All rise. Mr. Courts, again in session. Thank you. Please be seated. All right. At this time, we're back on the record on case CR 22211623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Daybell. The court will note that the state has rested its case in chief. At this time, then, I understand the defense is requesting to have a motion heard. We do have the defendant here along with defense counsel. The state's also present with the prosecutors. The jury is not present in the courtroom at this time. This motion will be argued outside of the presence of the jurors. 
Mr. Pryor, if you'd like to make a motion at this time, you may. And Judge, this is a motion for a directed verdict that is permissible under the criminal rules. Uh, I'm I'm going to do this, Judge, in a general sense without getting into specifics, but I'm going to move for a, a, a directed verdict on the uh, the murder charges. Uh, specifically with the Tylee and JJ, there is no indication that Mr. Debo was present, took an active part in, or uh, facilitated in any way the murder of JJ and, and Tylee. Uh, in regards to the conspiracy charges, there's no indication that there was any act that he took in furtherance. There's reference to re significant religious discussions, but that in itself is not a, 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 a an action in furtherance of, of those charges. Lastly, Judge, uh, in regards to the fraud, the only testimony I recall is that the insurance was upped from 10000 to 80000 and that there had already been a longstanding $300,000 policy from 2002. At this point, I don't think the state has met its burden regarding the fraud. And again, I don't think they've met their burden regarding the conspiracy on all of the conspiracy charges. And they have not met their burden uh, in regards to the murder as set forth previously. All right. Thank you for the argument, Mr. Pryor. Uh, who's going to be responding for the state? That would be me, Your Honor. All right. I think... Ms. Beatty, you can proceed with a response from the state. Thank you, Your Honor. On a motion for directed verdict, Your Honor, the state is entitled to all reasonable inferences that can be drawn from the evidence. And I think the case law is pretty clear that a motion for judgment of acquittal should only be granted when there is no evidence upon which to base a verdict of guilty. And that is from State versus Vargas, 100 Idaho 658. Uh, Essentially, the trial judge must review the evidence in the light most favorable to the state, recognizing full consideration must be given to the right of the jury to determine the credibility of witnesses. The jury gets to determine the weight of the evidence, as well as enjoying the right to draw all reasonable inferences from that evidence. And that's from State versus Huggins, 103 Idaho 422. Going through uh, the charges in this case, Your Honor, First, beginning with the conspiracy to commit the first degree murder uh, and grand theft by deception related to Tylee Ryan, the state charged a series of overt acts and the state uh, has presented evidence on all of those overt acts. Uh, number one being that uh, the defendant endorsed and espoused beliefs uh, designed to justify the homicide of Tylee Ryan, uh, specifically uh, statements made about her being dark um, these beliefs were part of the defendant's teachings, and it would be very reasonable for the jury to draw the inference that these beliefs that the defendant was espousing uh, were designed to dehumanize and justify the, dehumanize these victims and justify their homicide. As to number two, um, that his uh, uh, co-conspirator Lori Vallow changed the deposit on Tylee Ryan's J.P. Morgan Chase account to her. Uh, BBVA account. Uh, we also heard testimony from the state's financial witnesses to that effect, um, evidence that his co-conspirator and then mistress Lori Vallow moved to Idaho um, with his other co-conspirator Alex Cox, as well as uh, J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan. Multiple witnesses testified to this. Um, we heard evidence that the defendant himself did Google searches for the wind direction on uh, September 8th, 8th of 2019, the day, last day Tylee Ryan was seen alive and the day prior to when it, the state presented evidence that Tylee Ryan would have been buried on the defendant's property that is directly related to the defendant. Um, number five, Alex Cox um, went to co-conspirator Lori Vallow's apartment where Tylee Ryan lived in the early hours of 9-9. Uh, certainly there was evidence presented to that effect. And of note, there was also evidence that the defendant was in communication with Alex Cox at that time and that Alex Cox's phone was in the vicinity of the defendant's residence. Um, <clears throat> as to number six, that Lori Vallow never contacted Social Security. There was also testimony presented to this effect. Um, the jury also heard that uh, just weeks uh, prior to Tylee Ryan's death, death that uh Lori and Chad, Chad was aware that she would still be getting those Social Security checks after the death of Charles Vallow, um, which does link the defendant to that co-conspirator's actions in never contacting Social Security. Additionally, 
um, seven, uh, the seventh overt act that from September of 19 to January of 2020, Lori Vallow continued to collect those checks. And during a substantial portion of this time, Your Honor, the defendant was living with her in Hawaii and enjoying the proceeds of those checks, another reasonable inference that the jury could draw. As to the first degree murder charge of Tylee Ryan, uh, which is count two, the jury heard evidence that the defendant claimed that Tylee Ryan was dark, that he was Again, exchanging text messages with Alex Cox the day after she was last seen alive, that Alex Cox was in the vicinity of his residence. Uh, The jury heard evidence that the defendant texted his wife the morning of September 9, claiming that he had shot a raccoon raccoon and burnt some limbs. Um, And then Tylee Ryan's burnt and dismembered remains were found on the defendant's property her DNA found on the defendant's shovel and the defendant's pickaxe in the defendant's shed. So I think there is ample evidence on that count, Your Honor, and I think that does not uh, merit even consideration of uh, a judgment of acquittal. As to count three, I won't rehash all the overt acts because there is some overlap with the uh, count three uh, conspiracy conspiracy to commit first-degree murder of J.J. Vallow. The first overt act we've already discussed, which is the evidence of those uh, espoused religious beliefs justifying the homicide of J.J. Vallow. Um, Number two, we've already covered that, uh, that the defendant's co-conspirator and then mistress, Lori, moved to Idaho uh, with the children and with Alex Cox. Um, Overt act number three, uh, the jury heard evidence that Alex Cox, the defendant's co-conspirator, took custody of J.J. Vallow. Um, as to count or overt act number four, that co-conspirator Lori Vallow provided false information to law enforcement regarding JJ's whereabouts. Um, We did hear testimony of that as well. Uh, Number five and six, again, uh, those are also ones that we've already covered related to the financial issues. Count four, the first degree murder of JJ Vallow. Again, we have ample evidence uh, that a jury could reasonably conclude, use to reasonably conclude that the defendant is guilty of the murder of JJ Vallow. Uh, in addition to the planning and preparation evidence that the jury would have heard related to the conspiracy that we've already covered on September 23rd, the day after JJ was last seen alive, uh, witnesses. Uh, to testify to a tr- trial that they'd been staying with Lori Vallow uh, and that Lori told them that they not only saw Alex Cox with JJ, but that Lori t- then told them on the morning of the 23rd that JJ was with Alex. And the jury heard evidence about what Alex was doing that day because he was en route to the defendant's, the vicinity of the defendant's residence, and he was texting uh, with the defendant that morning. Um, also, the jury has heard, had heard that J.J., according to the defendant, J.J. was dark. We just heard evidence of that this very morning when the defendant was describing in text messages to Lori that J.J. wasn't himself and that he was possessed by some type of dark entity. And like Tylee, J.J.'s body was found in a grave on the defendant's property. Again, ample evidence from which a reasonable jury could conclude that the defendant was guilty, is guilty of the murder of J.J. Vallow. As to count five, um, the conspiracy to commit the first degree murder of Tammy Daybell, Um, again, the state alleged a series of overt acts and presented evidence on every single one of them. The first one, the espousing of religious beliefs similar to the other uh, other two conspiracy related charges, evidence was submitted on on that. Um, number two, again, we've already discussed that defendants, then mistress and co-conspirator Lori Vallow did move to Idaho to where the defendant lived, another overt act. Um, count three, exchanging text messages regarding death percentages on July 30th. The jury did hear evidence of that. Um, uh, overt acts four and five, that the defendant and Alex Cox exchanged burner phones. That came into evidence as well. Uh, overt act number six, that the defendant's co-conspirator, Lori Vallow, exchanged texts regarding Tammy Daybell being possessed by dark spirits and being in limbo. Um, the defendant and Lori Vallow were discussing that. And again, that evidence came in this very morning, Your Honor. Overt act number seven, that on September 8, the defendant uh, signed an application along with Tammy to increase her life map, life insurance policy to the maximum allowable under that policy. That came in via testimony and business records. 
Number eight, that the defendant's co-conspirator, Alex Cox, attempted to shoot Tammy Daybell. Evidence has been presented on that, Your Honor. Certainly, it's been a source of contention in this trial and a source of cross-examination, vigorous cross-examination, but ample evidence has been presented that that is exactly what occurred. Um, Overt Act number nine, that Alex Cox did multiple internet searches related to that shooting. Number 10, that Alex Cox went to the firing range in preparation for that attempted shooting. Uh, Number 11, that Alex Cox drove to the sportsman's where from the sportsman's warehouse to the Daybell residence on the 9th of October of 2019. And number 12, uh, that uh, Alex Cox was near the Daybell residence on the 18th of October 2019 when Tammy Daybell died. All, all of that, all of those overt acts, the jury heard evidence on, and it would be more than reasonable for them to conclude uh, that the defendant um, engaged in a conspiracy to, to kill Tammy Daybell. On count six, the actual first degree murder of Tammy Daybell, in addition to all of the preparation evidence that the jury heard related to the conspiracy, The defendant was telling numerous people in his life that Tammy was going to die soon. The jury heard evidence of that. Uh, They heard evidence that the defendant would send text messages to his mistress and co-conspirator Lori Vallow regarding how trapped he felt, but how freedom was coming. Um, The defendant's mistress, Lori Vallow, was shopping for wedding rings before Tammy even died. The defendant then told conflicting stories about how she died, when she died. At the defendant's funeral, Chad claimed that he had miraculously asked Tammy for all of her financial passwords just days before his death or her death. After Tammy's death, Chad immediately moved out, cashed out Tammy's life insurance policy and went to Hawaii to live with Lori Vallow, who he married just two weeks later. Um, And of course, the jury heard evidence that Tammy Daybell's death was ultimately deemed homicide by asphyxia. Again, we have ample evidence from which a jury could conclude that the defendant is guilty of the murder of Tammy Daybell. As to the final three counts regarding the grand theft and the insurance fraud, there was multiple. There were. Pardon, pardon. There's more to come in the trial of Chad Daybell. Press subscribe so you don't miss any of our continuing coverage right here from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast.